Joseph, the stand-in father. Today we'll be considering the story of Joseph as found in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. If you haven't already, please pause right now and have somebody in your group read that passage. The Gospel of Matthew begins with a detailed genealogy, beginning with Abraham, tracing through David, Israel's greatest king. It concludes with the words in verse 16, Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. The genealogy traces Jesus' lineage back to David, placing him in line for the ultimate kingship, Messiah, the Anointed One, the heir to David's kingdom who would rule over the kingdom of God forever. But it's not that simple. Since Jesus was born of a virgin mother, not of Joseph's seed at all, was Jesus really a descendant of David after all? It's pretty clear from what is not said in Matthew that his readers were familiar with the story of the virgin birth told in Luke's Gospel. Matthew's account, on the other hand, is told from Joseph's perspective. Matthew begins simply in verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Notice, he just states simply the facts of what his readers already knew without embellishment. One, Mary and Joseph were betrothed. Two, they had not come together, that is, had sex with each other. Three, Mary had begun to show she was pregnant. Four, the conception was from the Holy Spirit, not man. We knew these things, and so did Joseph, except point four. The story is familiar to us, but let's examine it in detail so that we might begin to understand the stand-in father that the Heavenly Father chose to raise his son. Joseph's name was a proud name, recalling the ancient Jewish name of one of the twelve patriarchs, Joseph, son of Jacob, who was sold by his brothers into Egypt and who later became second to Pharaoh in power over all Egypt, saving his family from famine. His name means to add. <clears throat> Joseph was no doubt older than Mary. While girls were married by 13 or 14, old enough to bear children, husbands, on the other hand, needed to be established enough to support a wife before they could enter into marriage. Husbands were legally obligated to provide food, clothing, and shelter. But they didn't have to do it all by themselves. In the West, newly married couples get their own apartment and live independently, but not in Palestine. In first century Galilee, Joseph would probably take Mary home to the house in which he lived with his parents, perhaps grandparents, as well as brothers and sisters who might be at home. Only as his own family grew would Joseph and his family like, likely get their own house. Now, this may sound very crowded and non-private to you, but it had its advantages. Instead of a young couple out on their own in a large household, each member contributed to the economy of the family by their own work, making enough for the whole to subsist on. A couple cut off from the economy of the extended family would have to fend for themselves, as Mary and Joseph had to do in Bethlehem. These were mighty lean times. We know from Matthew 13.55 that Joseph was a carpenter by trade. But the town of Nazareth was small enough that carpentry wouldn't have been all he did. Carpenters and other tradesmen would also keep a garden and, and a couple of animals for food. They also might do some subsistence farming to eke out a living in this agrarian society of rural Galilee. But when townspeople needed some carpentry done that was beyond their own skills and tools, Joseph would be the one they came to. As a rule, the common man built his own house, probably with the help of family and neighbors. A family might have a knife and hammer of some kind. But a carpenter would possess both specialized tools, some fairly expensive, and the skills to use them. Saws, axes, awls, drills, plumb lines, chisels, and planes. 
With these tools, a skilled carpenter might fashion doors, beams, and perhaps gates. He would make plows and yokes and other wood implements. All furniture would be made by hand as well. But carpentry didn't make Joseph wealthy, not by any means. The offering Mary and Joseph brought to the temple on the occasion of Mary's purification from childbirth was the offering of a poor man, a pair of doves or pigeons. Carpentry was Joseph's world, and the world that Jesus grew up in. He played in the wood shavings on the floor of his father's shop. Carpentry was Joseph's trade, and the trade he taught his son. Jesus learned from Joseph to saw and plane, drill and smooth. He watched his father, the local contractor, make business contracts and deal with customers. Jesus saw it all. Let's pause here, though, for discussion question one that will help us think about the life that Joseph would have led. What would Jesus have learned as the son of a carpenter? What experiences would this have exposed him to? Pause the DVD now, then resume when you finish discussing. Where we find ourselves in this story, however, Joseph is faced not with a carpentry crisis, but with the pregnancy of his betrothed. You can bet that tongues in this small town were wagging furiously with the news. Mary is pregnant. Couldn't Joseph and Mary wait? They know better. Joseph has been deeply embarrassed by the whole incident. He alone knows that he is not the father. He supposes that Mary, who as a betrothed woman and legally his wife, has had an affair with someone or another. Unless she has been raped, but she has said nothing of the sort. The only conclusion that he can reach is that she has been unfaithful. His betrothed is an adulteress. Mary's pregnancy had placed her at considerable risk in this society. First of all, her husband, her betrothed husband, would reject her. Her pregnancy would embarrass him and reflect on his character. She couldn't expect him to understand or ex accept her condition. And then the penalty. At worst, she could be stoned. The law provided in cases like this for possible stoning. And then shunning. At best, her family would allow her to live at home, though her supposed adultery would hurt their standing in the community. She and her bastard child would be shunned. And then remarriage. No upstanding man would ever marry her, since the stigma of her supposed adultery would remain with her and taint the reputation of any husband. Nowhere to go. She couldn't go to the city and be lost in its anonymity. Single women just didn't live alone. This was a family-centered culture where a woman's work centered around home and family. There was no work for single women, except perhaps as a, a housekeeper in a wealthy home or prostitution. Mary had said to the angel, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. May it be to me according to your word. But now, the cost of this decision is painfully apparent. Time for the grace of God to come into play. We begin to see the character of the man to whom she was betrothed in verse 19 of our passage. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Matthew says that he was a righteous or just man. The Greek word pertains to being in accordance with high standards of rectitude, upright, just, fair. Here, probably, interested in doing the right thing. Honorable, just, good. Righteous meant that Joseph carefully observed the law and valued his own reputation. According to the customs of that time, adultery would make her unmarriageable to either her betrothed husband or to a paramour if one had been discovered. By marrying her, Joseph would compromise himself in the eyes of the law. But his righteousness went deeper than a mere external righteousness before Jewish law. He was honorable and wanted to do the right thing. The wrong thing, he decided, was to demand prosecuting her for adultery, that is, expose her to public disgrace or make a public example of her. He couldn't marry her, of course, since he knew that her baby was not his. 
But instead of a messy trial, he had decided to divorce her quietly. He would simply write out a certificate of divorce and present it to her in the presence of two witnesses as required by law. To avoid the accusation of adultery as the reason for the divorce, Joseph could have offered less serious grounds, acknowledged by Pharisees of the school of Hillel. To divorce quietly probably means to divorce leniently. We see in Joseph a gentleness and maturity, a righteous man, but not a man full of himself. Joseph was a man seeking to do the right thing. Well, let's pause here for discussion question two, based on verse 19. What were Mary's options, being pregnant and carrying a baby, not her husband's? What kind of character did Joseph exhibit by deciding to divorce Mary quietly and leniently? Then God changed Joseph's mind. In Matthew 1, verses 20 to 21, we read, But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Three times we have a record of God speaking to Joseph. It is through an angel of the Lord appearing to him in a dream. Each time when he wakes up, he immediately obeys the messenger. The form of address, son of David, emphasizes Joseph's honored position as a direct descendant of David, Israel's greatest king, and from whom descendants, the Messiah, should come. The message was not, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Of course, according to Jewish law, she already was his wife. But the messenger assures Joseph that it is right and just for him to proceed with the relationship. Her pregnancy is not adulterous, but from the Holy Spirit. Next, the angel tells Joseph the name to be given to the child, Jesus. Jesus was not an uncommon name at this time, since the, the Hebrew name Yeshua is a shortened form of Joshua, who was one of Israel's most celebrated heroes. But the significance of God's insistence that he be named Jesus is not to honor a national hero, but because of the meaning of the name, Yahweh saves. Verse 21 reads, You are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus is Yahweh's salvation, embodied in human form. As a little baby, Yahweh saves Jesus, might have been born and raised in the humblest of circumstances, but that never diminished who he was. His destiny was to save. The Greek verb sozo means to preserve or rescue from natural dangers and afflictions. Save, keep from harm, preserve, rescue. Here, to save or preserve from eternal death, to bring messianic salvation. Seeing the Messiah as Savior was the popular Jewish understanding of the Messiah's role at the time. But the angel made it clear to Joseph that this salvation would not be political or military. Jesus' mission was not to overthrow the Roman oppressors and reinstate the Jewish kingdom. His kingdom, his mission, was to save his people from a far more insidious enemy, sin. Jesus came to destroy the power of sin. Well, let's pause here for discussion question three, based on verse 21. What is the significance of the name Jesus? Why do you think the angel gave the name to both Mary and Joseph independently? Pause the DVD now and then resume when you're finished discussing. Before we leave it, let's take one final look at this command. You are to give him the name Jesus, verse 21. Joseph is commanded to personally name the child. This is deeply significant. It means that Joseph, in naming the child, acknowledges him as his own son 
and thus becomes the legal father of the child according to Semitic law. As a result of this legal adoption, Joseph's ancestry as a descendant of David transfers also to his legal son. Biologically, Jesus is begotten by the Holy Spirit and is thus the Son of God, according to Luke 1.32. But legally, he is the son of Joseph and heir to the promises of David, Joseph's ancestor. The angel Gabriel had promised Mary, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. In Joseph, naming the boy and therefore adopting him, David becomes Jesus earthly ancestor. The angel's message is complete. Now Matthew explains all this in terms of an ancient prophetic word in verses 22 to 23. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Joseph is quoting Isaiah 7.14 because he sees in it a prefiguring of the virgin birth of Jesus. In its original setting, Isaiah is exhorting Ahaz, king of Judah, the southern kingdom, who faces the daunting threat of a siege of Jerusalem by the armies of Israel, the northern kingdom, and its ally Aram Damascus, a petty Syrian kingdom. Isaiah tells Ahaz not to fear, but to stand firm in faith as a sign The Lord says that a virgin will conceive and bear a child and be called Emmanuel as a reminder that God is with his people in times of trouble. In the time that it will take this baby to become just a young child, the king of Assyria will have destroyed Judah's enemies. Some believe that the reference is to some child born in Isaiah's day. Others see in it a brief prophetic insight, a glimpse far into the future of a child who will be born to a virgin and bring God's very presence to deliver his people. Clearly, Matthew sees the virgin conception and the name Emmanuel as having a fuller meaning in Christ. The Greek word fulfill means to make full or fulfill, then to bring to completion, complete, finish, and as here, to bring to a designed end fulfill a prophecy. Prophecy in the Old Testament takes several shapes, including exhortation, a directive word from God to a particular person or people at a particular time, or prediction, a clear foretelling of the future for a person or nation. Three, sometimes we see acted prophecy, such as Hosea marrying a prostitute to illustrate Israel's unfaithfulness. And then foreshadowing, where a contemporary prophetic event or insight foreshadows a distant one, so there is a double fulfillment. A present time fulfillment, the type, and a future completion, the antitype, which brings the prophecy to fullness or completion. I see in Isaiah's words, in Isaiah 7.14, the latter kind of prophetic word. The initial fulfillment presumably took place in the prophet's time, while the ultimate fulfillment and completion of this word is found in Christ. Let's pause here now for discussion question 4, based on verse 23. How did the prophetic concept of the virgin conception and the name Emmanuel find their fullness in the birth of Jesus to Mary. Emmanuel, with an E or with an I, depending on how you spell it, is a transliteration of the Hebrew name in Isaiah 7.14, literally, with us is God. Originally, it symbolized the presence of God to deliver his people from the Assyrian army that threatened their very existence in Isaiah's day. Though to our knowledge, the name Emmanuel was never given to Jesus, it certainly applied to him, since God with us is a perfect way to describe the birth of the God-man, Jesus Christ, who is fully man and fully God. Verses 24 and 25 read, When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife but he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. As soon as he woke up, Joseph obeyed. 
He accepted Mary as his wife and took her home, but didn't have sex with her. Well, let's pause now for discussion question 5, based on verses 24 to 25. What does Joseph accepting Mary as his wife say about his character? What is the significance for prophetic fulfillment of Jesus as son of David that Joseph named the child Jesus? The final things we learn about Joseph happen a few years after Jesus' birth. First, after the wise men came to worship Jesus, an angel commanded Joseph to flee from Herod's soldiers. Joseph obeyed immediately and left in the middle of the night for Egypt. After Herod's death, when he perceived that the threat was over, Joseph brought Mary and the child back to Israel, returning to Nazareth, in spite of what scandal still might remain there. In Nazareth, the family now lived. It was here that Jesus was raised and that he learned the trade of carpentry from his father. The scripture tells us nothing of Joseph's death, though presumably he was not living during the time of Jesus' ministry, or Jesus would not have felt the need to entrust his mother Mary's care to the beloved disciple. What we learn from the scripture about Joseph is that God chose to father his Jesus, a man who was devout, full of faith, obedient to God, just, merciful, and one who loved and carefully guarded both Mary and the child Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for Joseph, who proved worthy of your trust to raise Jesus. Help us to be as believing, as faithful, as zealous to take on the various tasks that you assign to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.